right. Hey, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, we, are, we are just so excited you've joined us here at Community this weekend. Um, this is such an amazing weekend. Um, and I just want to kind of introduce myself real quick. I know that you guys, most of you guys know me, but uh, my name's Donnie. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we're, man, we're in this series called Bright Light in a Dark Place. And, and I just want to welcome you, whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, thank you so much uh, for joining us this week. We are, uh, like I said, we're in this series called Bright Light in a Dark Place. And, and we're actually wrapping up our series this week. And, uh, and we're going to be moving on to a different series next week. But um, this series, we've been talking about uh, the book of Philippians. And, and it was written by Paul. And, uh, and it's written by Paul in this moment in time where he could have he been in his darkest season of life. He was sitting in a jail cell, chained to guards. Think about that for a second. He, he took this time when he was in what could have been his, his darkest season of life and instead took this time to, to write to the, to the people in Philippi, to the people in the city, the church of Philippi, and to instead to encourage them that they have the opportunity to be a bright light in a dark world. That's what we need right now, Right? That's what, that's what we need right now. We, we need to have the opportunity to, to be that bright light. Our, our world needs us now. And, and I'm, I'm so excited to get to wrap up this series because we're going to get to talk about, I, I think, one of probably the second most famous verse in the entire Bible. And it, it's one of these verses that people use all the time in Philippians chapter 4 um, just to to give them this moment of peace, of understanding, of strength. But really what I think is we tend to actually take it a little bit out of context. But, but we're going to talk about that this week. And, it, and again, we, we've been talking through this book of Philippians, talking about how us as Christians should act in a world of darkness in order for us to be that bright light in a dark world. And as many of you know, um, if you don't know, I don't know where you've been, but this coming week is Halloween. And Halloween is, is this opportunity for us. And for me, I love Halloween. I love Halloween because I get to get dressed up. I love hop- Halloween because it's this opportunity for me to be super social. I love it because it's this opportunity for me to get to have fun, to talk to other people. And, and it's just this great thing that happens. And, and one of the great things that happens from, from this holiday is that a lot of us get to spend a lot of time with our families, right? Maybe you take your kids and you guys all dress up as a family and uh, you get these, these times to just spend time walking from house to house or, or wherever it is. And, and uh, maybe you decorate your house. Maybe you, you welcome trick-or-treaters to your house. Whatever it is, it's this great opportunity for us to be together as families. And I love this opportunity as, as we come up to Halloween uh, to be together with our families. Uh, one thing that was pointed out to me recently is that I have, I have this trend with the costumes that I wear on Halloween recently. And I, I, I wonder if you can pick up on this trend. Um, a couple years ago, I was Aladdin. Uh, the, next, the next year, I was Maui. Um, the next year... Uh, it was a little bit different. I was Olaf. Um, and then the next year, I was, I, I was er, this year, I'm going to be King Triton. Some of you guys are sh- talking, saying Disney, but there's another common theme besides one thing. They're all shirtless. <laughs> I just so happen every single year, except last year, to get to dress up shirtless. I mean, I actually wear a skin suit because I don't want to show off my perfect bod and all of that. Um, but no, every single year, our family dresses up in themes. And, uh, and so I get to be this shirtless character every single year. But, but I, I say this all because this week, this in, a, in less than a week, we're going to give everybody the opportunity to, to live out part of our mission statement here at Community. 
Um, if you're new to community or, or you've missed it before, our mission statement is stepping in, building up, living out. And, uh, and so every single week, we hope that people are uh, coming along in this mission statement, taking a, <coughs> a step in one of these. And so every single week, uh, we have the opportunity for people to step into a relationship with Jesus. That's what, what we do mostly in our worship services. It's we step into a relationship with Jesus. But we also want people to move into building up and living out. And so this week, I don't know, we've talked about it a little bit, but this week in particular, we have this opportunity for you to live out your faith. Um, and it's at our trunk or treat. And, and the reason we have the opportunity to live out our faith is, is because we've created this moment for you, for us as a church, to, to really create a safe place. To create a safe place for kids to come on Halloween when, when they could be somewhere else, right? Kids could be going somewhere else. They could, they could, uh, parents could be worried about their kids. They could be worried about where they're going, all of this. But we have created this opportunity for you to, to come alongside us to create this safe space. We, we want you to dress up. We want you to, to have fun. We want you to volunteer and to, and to really to live out your faith. This is this opportunity for people to, for you to get to serve, to come alongside us to help create this safe space. And so uh, we're creating this opportunity for you to live out your faith. And so what I want you to do right now, if you haven't already, take your phones out, sign up to be a candy car, sign up to volunteer, sign up to be a change maker because um, we're just excited about what God has in store. Last year we had 2,000 kids. We're expecting so much more. And so I want to encourage you, if you have not already, take your phone out, sign up, to volunteer for this. This is an opportunity for you to, to put your faith into action, to, to, to be a part of being the change makers for this week, uh, next week. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And I'm going to go ahead and say thank you. Thank you to, to those of you who have already signed up to be a change maker. And uh, this week, we're talking about something that flows straight from what Pastor John talked about last week. Uh, Pastor John gave us three main things that we needed to do starting last week. And it's this, choose joy, start praying, and fix our thoughts on Jesus. Choose joy, start praying, and fix our thoughts on Jesus. And man, has that been challenging this week for me. To be honest, this is, this is one of those things that, that as I was listening, I was like, okay, I do great in all of these things. I am a really joyful person most of the time. I, I pray all the time. And man, I, I think about Jesus a lot. I mean, it's my job. I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to think about Jesus. This week, it just, she is right. It was just like, oh no, God is, God is going to push me and challenge me this week. And so it seemed like every moment that I, I tried to focus, I tried to like focus in it and really fix my mind on, on what God was saying and really just to focus on, on preparing for this week. And it, it, it was like I got distracted. It was like something came up and, and, and family or whatever it was just kind of pulled my attention away. And it's all good things, but... Man, I, I think a lot of the times in our lives, we, we struggle with some of this stuff. And I just want to be real with you. One of those weeks was last week for me. But we need to, like John said last week, we need to start choosing joy in our lives. There's so much in our lives we can be joyful for. There's so much in our lives we can rejoice in. And, and we've got to start praying. We've got to start praying to see what God wants us to do. We've got to start praying so that we can see how we can live out our faith. And then we've got to fix our eyes. We've got to fix our thoughts on the thoughts that God wants to give us. And, and that's exactly something we're going to talk about this week. Because if we're going to fix our thoughts on Jesus, it's going to change our attitudes. And so uh, this week, we're, we're wrapping up Philippians. And so I want you to go ahead, take your phones out, open up the message notes, take your Bible out, whatever it is. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. And uh, it's just some closing thoughts that Paul has. But, but it, 
just think about this. If it's the very last thing that Paul puts in his letter, it's probably some important things that he wants us to know. It's probably some things that he's just, he's tying a bow around everything. And these are the final thoughts. And so he starts out Philippians 4, the end of it, um, about how we need to rejoice in everything that we can do. And so as you're opening up your Bibles or your Bible app, here we go. Philippians 4, uh, verse 10, it starts with this. I rejoiced. There's that word that we talked about last week again. I rejoiced. I chose joy greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. And indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. That, this week, continued to get to me. And again, he's asking us to, to rejoice. That he's, he's telling them that he is rejoicing, that they are concerned for him. They're concerned for him because he is in chains. But get this, even in his chains, Paul knew that he was not in need anymore. Even in his darkness, he, he was not in need. He understood that in every situation that he was in, in everything that he had, he he had the opportunity to be in need, but he was not in need because he was content. He understood that even in his, his, his time that he could have been in need for the greatest moment, it was his greatest opportunity to be content. Even in the challenging circumstances he was in. And this is all ties back to what he talks about early on in Philippians, in this letter to the Philippians, in Philippians 1. The very first chapter, and in Philippians chapter 1, he talks about that even though he may be at a point where death is inevitable for him, that death was, was the only option left on the table for him, that even though that was the end for him, that he wanted Christ to be glorified. This is what it says in Philippians 1.20. I eagerly expect that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, what, what Paul has realized is that in, in his letter, he's writing to the Philippians, is that even in his death, he is content with where he is. Even in his circumstances, even in the darkness, he is content with where he is. And again, this is a man in prison who had the opportunity to, to be downtrodden, to, to, to understand that contentment was where he needed to be. And this word uh, content may be something that we, we struggle with. We're may, maybe we, we really don't understand the definition of it because we read it and we're like, okay, I am content. But here's the definition. The definition of content is in a state of peaceful happiness. A state of peaceful happiness. It's this, this opportunity, it's a, it's a mindset for us of happiness. And we have to understand that we have to be happy with where we work. We have to be in the state of mind of a happiness with your kids. A state, of mind, a state of mind where we have to change to this, this understanding that we have to choose happiness. And so the way we view our lives, and we stop, have to just stop looking at the way we view our lives. The, the dog eat dog world, the I, I got to get what's mine, I got to get what's mine, get ahead in the game. And instead, we've got we've to be happy with where we are. We have to change the way we view our lives in that way. I'm going to start looking, stop looking for all the people around us. And start focusing on what God calls us to do. 
And I feel like I, I say this every time that I'm, I'm up here, but, but we have to realize that we have been put in a position, a strategic position by God where we can be a bright light in a dark world. Every single one of us has been put in a specific position so that God can use us where we're at. Maybe, maybe you're at a school and you don't like it. And you have a class you don't like. Maybe God has put you in this position, in this place where you have the opportunity to be the best influence that these kids could ever have. And so we have to choose happiness in these moments. Or, or maybe you have a boss that's just a jerk all the time. And you really don't want to work for him anymore. But maybe, maybe God's put you in this position for a specific reason. Maybe God's put you in this workplace so that you can pray for your boss. That you can maybe have a conversation about the joy that Jesus can give to them. Maybe God has put you in this position so that you, you can show them what it looks like to be happy even though you may not love what you're doing. Maybe God has put you in this, this season of life, this position of life, so that you can be joyful in this season even though it's not where you want to be. Maybe you're in a situation where you feel like you can't be content. You can't be content because you just can't do it anymore. And the reality is, is that Paul understood exactly where you were. Paul understands exactly where you were because he's writing this letter to the Philippians in his darkest season. And he's writing his letter to, the, to us in his darkness. And that's what he talks about in the next verse. He says, I know what it's like to be in need. Paul understood what it's like to be in need. And he says, I know what it's like to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. See, Paul has understood, he, he's realized that, that even though he may be on one end of the spectrum or the other, he has realized that the secret of being content. See, Paul knows that, and he's saying that every one of us has been like him in each season. Paul's been in this moment of authority. He's had everything he's ever wanted. He was a Pharisee. He knew the Bible. He walked around. He was killing Christians. He had orders to execute. He was taken care of. And now that he was a Christian, now that he, he, he accepted Jesus, everything changed and and he changed to, to live out the gospel. And so he was now in prison and he was in chains. And Paul says, even though I, I was at this point, I had everything I could ever need. And now I'm at this point where I'm in prison. I understand what it looks like. He understood what it looked like to have everything he ever needed. And then also to have nothing. And in that understanding, he realized that the key to this, the secret to this, was being content. Was being content. And, and he, he realized that he had to stop doing and instead look to the one who can make us feel whole again. He, he found out that the secret to being content is what it says in verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's the secret to contentment right there. The secret to being content is to stop looking around every, at everybody else. And instead, the secret to contentment is Christ. The secret to contentment is Christ. It's not the next paycheck. It's not that next drink of alcohol. It's not that one more car, that nicer car. It's not that 
new vacation. It's not that next house. It's not that that next place. It's not whatever that next thing is that's going to come our way to make us into the person that that we think that we want to be. The thing that will make us content is Christ. That's the secret to us finding happiness, finding a life full of happiness. It's Christ. See, it's pretty simple. If if we want to see the thing that we've been missing all along, the hole in our, our lives, we've got to find Christ. Maybe we've maybe we've strived to just get to that next place. Maybe we've strived to just get to the next thing because the the reality is, is that the moment in our lives that we've strived to, to just get to the next place means that we've actually just been missing Jesus the whole time. The moments when we've ran to the drugs, the moments when we, we've ran to that next drink, the moments we've ran to sex or pornography or whatever it is, it, the reality is it's because we've stopped looking for the one who can give us contentment or happiness. That's Jesus. The one that can make us whole. And so church, we've got to stop looking to fill ourselves up And instead, look to the one who can give us the strength to be content. That's exactly what Paul is telling us in Philippians 4, is that for us to get to a point where we are happy with where we are, we have to stop seeking out everything else that can fill us up. And instead, we need to seek out Jesus. We need to seek his life and what he can do for our lives because it's Christ that's going to help us get through our situations. It's Christ that's going to help us get through our dark seasons. We have to stop trying to find all of our answers to questions and instead we have to stop looking at the news. We've got to stop looking around for all the answers for our questions and instead look to Jesus for all of our answers because through him, He can give us the strength. In him, we can find the true meaning for happiness. Maybe your whole life, maybe you've just felt this emptiness in your life your whole life. You've been seeking something to fill it, but you haven't found the answer. You're empty. Maybe you've turned over all the rocks and you've been searching, and you just haven't found the answer. I think the problem is you've not been looking in the right places. Matthew 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. This is Jesus saying, if you just ask, it's going to be given to you. If you just look, you'll find it. If you'll just knock, the door will be opened. And maybe maybe it's time to, to stop asking everybody else for the answer and to start seeking out the right place for happiness through Jesus Christ. In order for us to have happiness, we need to let Jesus into our lives. We need to let him actually be in control of our lives. We need to knock at the door and truly let Jesus into our lives. And I believe, if I'm honest, there's there's parts of our lives that we've let Jesus have control of our lives. We've let Jesus be a part of our lives, but I I believe that there's other parts in our lives where we've put Jesus on the outside and told him to sit on the sidelines. And if we're going to be content, we can't let God just be a part of our lives. I believe we have to let him be the one in control of our lives. But in reality, we try to hold on to him. We try to hold on to our lives and, and, and the reality is, is that God wants our full lives. He wants the nooks and the crannies. 
He wants the dark places that no one else can ever see. He wants every part of our life. And I, I want you to think of it this way. Um, in my hand right here is a clicker. Um, this, this clicker for this representation is our lives. And I think sometimes in our lives, we live our lives like this. With my fist closed on the clicker, I have full control over my life, right? Like I can move my hand up and down, all around. I have control over the clicker. It is mine, no matter what. You'll have to come and pry it out of my hands, but it, I have full control over it. And I believe that this is how some of us live our lives. Some of us live our lives where we want full control. We want full control over our lives. And if it doesn't benefit me, then there's, there's no way I'm going to do it. And for some of you, this has gotten you into some really dark places. Because you want control over everything. Maybe your marriages haven't worked out. Because you want full control over everything. You just can't, you can't overcome that addiction. You, you want full control over everything, so you can't, you can't hold down a stable job. So someone says something to you that you, you just don't like, and, and so you just shut them down. You stop talking to them. You're not friends with them anymore. And I believe this is how a lot of us live our lives before we come to Christ, before we let Jesus actually into our lives. We have firm control over everything. And I believe this is how, how a lot of us want to live our lives. And then there's, there's some of us, we live our lives like this. We, we open up our hands. Now, if I open up my hand, I, I lose a little bit of control over, over it, right? Like, I can't just move my hand wherever I want to, or else the clicker is going to fall out of my hand. I can, I can move my hand, though, and I still have some control. I have a little bit of control. I can move my hand up and down all around. And it still goes where I want to. And I believe this is probably where most of us are in this room. We want to say that we want God to have full control over our lives. But in reality, we still have a grasp kind of on it. Maybe, maybe we've accepted Jesus into our lives and we, we've opened up the control of our lives. But if that vacation pops up, that's just so, something so much better. We're gone. Or maybe that, that conversation with that friend starts and, and you can tell it's going to be a hard conversation and, and you just say, okay, I, I'll pray for you and you walk away. Or maybe God's prompting you to go and to talk to that person in the grocery store, to do nice for somebody in the grocery store and, and instead we turn the other aisle, walk around and say, maybe, maybe that was just for somebody else. Whatever it is, I feel like most of us Christians live our lives like this. We have some control over our life. And we say we want Jesus to be number one. We say we want Jesus to be the center of our lives, but we still want some control over our lives. We say we want to live our lives for God, but we still struggle with those addictions. We struggle with all the things that come around with us. You've been going through life and you're ready for something more. You're not really content with where you are because you've, you've been searching for it elsewhere. You, you say you want Jesus, but you look everywhere else for that happiness. And you just really aren't happy in your situation. But what I, I believe that God, the way God wants us to live our lives is this way. I'm going to... I believe God wants us to live our lives with our palms down. 
the true way we can be happy, to be content, is to stop looking for everyone else, to stop looking under every other rock, to stop looking for that addiction to, to make us happy, to start doing, stop doing everything on our own. And instead, to live our lives with our palms down. When we live our lives with our palms down, we have no control. We have, we have given everything actually up to Jesus. If we live our lives, palms down, we start to live our lives, what it talks about in, Matthew, in, uh, in chapter 1, in a, lie, in a way that is worthy of the gospel. If we start to live our lives palm down, we have the opportunity how God can, to see how God can truly work in our lives. We've just got to actually give up full control of our lives. When we live our lives palms down, we start to let God actually take control of our lives. And we'll start to live our lives more content. More content with what? He is going to do in our lives. And we'll actually let him take control of our life. We'll, let, we'll open up those places to him that maybe we've just been holding back. So I want to challenge you this week. What's it look like for you to open up your life, to, to live your life palms down? Maybe it's opening up those, those dark places and actually letting Jesus into them. Maybe, it, maybe for you, it's, it's letting God actually move and work in your finances, which is exactly what we're going to talk about next week. Maybe, maybe for you, it's, it's letting God actually into your addiction and letting him to, to be able to help you overcome your addiction. Maybe it's, it's letting him into your relationships or your friendships, whatever it is. Whatever it is, we have to realize that the true secret to us finding happiness, to finding contentment is Christ. We've got to stop looking at everyone else, at everywhere else, and the way, the way we can find happiness and contentment is through Christ. And maybe if we start to live our lives palms down, we'll start to have that peaceful happiness we've been looking for our entire lives. For some of us in this room, I, I know that this is, this is a huge step because you've never, you've never let Jesus into your life ever. And for you, you're... You're ready to take a step, maybe. You're ready to, to say, I'm all in with him. You're ready to step into a relationship with Jesus. If, if you're ready to step into a relationship with Jesus, after service, we're going to have a prayer team down front. We'll have people outside. We'll be outside. We want to just have a conversation with you on what it looks like to actually let God into your life, to let him have control over your life. Whatever it is, where, wherever you are in your faith, I want to encourage you, take that step. Step into a relationship with him. Maybe you're joining us online. If you're joining us online, you can email us, office at community.cc, or you can fill out the communication card in the app. Or, or maybe, maybe you're not comfortable yet talking to someone about it, and you're here in the room with us. You can do that. You can email us. You can fill out the app and just say, I'm ready to make a first-time decision. Well, what I want you to know is that this is probably the best decision you can make with your life. To let God actually have control of your life. But maybe there's some of us in this room. We've taken that step. But we've been living our lives with our palms up. Still kind of in control of our lives. I want to challenge you this week. Start to live your life closer and palms down. Let God into those places you, you don't let anybody else into. Choose joy. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Choose contentment. Because I believe that's where happiness will start. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. God, that you, you give us the opportunity God, to just to say we're all in with you. 
And God, I pray for those of us in the room that are ready to take a step of faith, to, to step into a relationship with you, God. God, I pray that we have the, the strength to step into that relationship, to step out and to say that we're ready to be all in with you, God. God, for those of us in the room, I, I pray that we, we take that step. God, for the rest of us, I pray that we start to live our lives open to what you want us to do. Ready to listen, to, to pray, to choose joy, to choose your, your will in our lives. To really let you have full control over our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen.